ons wil wen. Nee, ek nie, ons wil wen. Jij maakt een bijdrage. Ik zal die leiding geven. Jij zal die vijand doen. Ik zal voor jou zeggen hoe om dit te doen. My life since then has been very, very difficult. It's had a big element of self-destruction. I was hypervigilant. I was having screaming nightmares every night for at least six months. This guy heard a helicopter, he would shoot under his bed. He would like go into... This guy was... his nerves were shot. When the pressure on the South African government increased during the 1970s and the remaining European colonies in Southern Africa became independent, South Africa became involved in wars on and over its borders. In 1975, South Africa launched a large-scale war in Angola after the Portuguese colonizers suddenly withdrew. South Africa was fighting with the UNITA movement of Dr. Jonas Savimbi, who was pro-West, against the Marxist liberation movement that became the first independent government of Angola, the MPLA. Military forces from Cuba got involved with the MPLA at more or less the same time as South Africa. South Africa was occupying Namibia at the time, treating it almost as a colony. The guerrillas of the liberation movement, SWAPO, fiercely resisted this occupation, and the war in northern Namibia raged for almost three decades until Namibia's independence in 1990. The South African Defence Force needed soldiers to fight these wars. The number of permanent professional soldiers in the SADF was too small. A system of compulsory military service, often simply called national service, was then launched. By the 1970s, all able-bodied white men over 16 were compelled to do military service. By the mid-1980s, the young troops were also forced to patrol South Africa's turbulent black townships. A small number of young men refused to serve in the apartheid army. Some fled the country and lived in exile. Others were sent to jail inside the country. The end conscription campaign was launched to represent those who refused to do military service. In the almost two decades of military conflict ending in 1990, hundreds of thousands of young white men served in the Defense Force. Thousands died in action. Many more were damaged psychologically. The Truth Commission regarded military service as a violation of these men's human rights and held special hearings on the matter. Wallace McGregor died in uniform at age 20 in 1987. Like so many thousands of mothers of national servicemen, Wallace's mother, Anna Marie, struggles to come to terms with his death. As I do it, to say, say, Frau, yeah, Anna Marie, I do it. Yes. I got not so scrick, a scrick. Ik wil het doen. En. Wat kan je nou doen? Nee. Wat maakte het harder voor Annemarie McGregor om met haar zoon's dood te gaan, was dat ze niet allowed te zien zijn body, die arrived in een plastic bag. Als mijn kind doodgerei was in die straat, dan kon ik zien dat hij doodgerei in die straat. En ik kon zien dat hij het zeer gekregen heeft. Of misschien kon ik bijgewezen het om voor hem vast te houden. Want achterna had je gewonnen, was hij bang, het hij geskrik, het hij zeer gekregen, het hij geroep, had wit voor hem gejaap. Wat was daar gedoen om voor hem dit makkelijker te maken? Daarvan weet ons niks. Absoluut niks. Ik wens to ons the National Party if they thought they could get away with these lies. I want them to know that we all know the truth today. 
Magnus Malan started a help center for former soldiers just last week. I don't think any of the former soldiers want your help. To them, you are nothing but a liar. To P.W. Borta and his cabinet of those days, explain to my mother and my father and to all South Africans how and why my brother died. The Truth Commission also heard the story of a 17-year-old man who was sent to fight in Angola and Namibia. He wrote a diary which he called the Diary of a Dying Man, and then he committed suicide. His grandmother, while staying anonymous, believed the Truth Commission and the nation should hear his story. We were issued enemy uniforms, rifles, ammunition, weapon gear and transport. We were to tie yellow scarves on our shoulders to go, enemy or not. Infiltration deep into enemy territory disguised we attack. We attack where we can by total surprise, walk right up to them shouting, don't shoot, we are on patrol, we are one of us in Portuguese, and shoot the shit out of everything. We attack Huambo and the Benuela railway line. Big up. Training camp turns out to be Typhoon Rest Camp. Shot the sh out of us. 230 dead, 800 wounded, three lost, presumed dead. Rough but almost correct estimate of our losses. A squadron Puma helicopters flew almost 14 hours non-stop to get us out. To go on again to Quito, Carnival. Do you know what it is like to fight 4,000 kilometers from home? The worst shit, and you wonder why they go nuts? I have run, I have died, I have crawled. I have shot myself, literally and truly. In all this time we went on, I wanted out. No, they say. What hurts a lot is that we believed in the government. You know, that, that also hurts. We believed in them. Although they blame the white people, we didn't know. I hurt so, I can't cry anymore. It's, it's driving me insane. God help me, come down and speak my pain into people I love. Tell, tell them how I feel. Let them know I can't live like this. They say you have never lived until you have almost died. I have died on the 27th of October in 87. It's kind of funny to know that you will die in less than nine hours. Everything is different. It is as if your soul knows. Back in South Africa, white society glorified the so-called boys on the border. But few knew what really happened in the war zone. And when the soldiers came back, there was little understanding of their difficulties reintegrating with society. Former national servicemen also gave evidence before the Truth Commission, some giving harrowing descriptions of how their forced participation in war affected their sanity. I uh, gave the instruction for them to flatten the hut with a Casper and that we would open fire. Um, at the same time. Um, it's an overkill situation that was typically Kufut. We would shoot as much as concentrated fire into space as possible. We didn't know how many people might be in there with him, uh, what they were armed with and so on. So it was overkill just in case. And as we opened up this rifle barrel of the person next to me was shot by the person next to him. So the rifle barrel actually became bent and useless. He was firing on automatic, his gun blew up and it sounded like a hand grenade. And what went through my mind was that this person, the, the person in the hut had thrown this hand grenade at us. Uh, we were sprayed with shrapnel from the barrel of this gun and blowing up. And this, obviously this loud bang that went with it. I got such a shock, I, I ripped off the stock. I had an AK-47 and I just kept on firing my hand was being burnt by the barrel, but I was just crazy at that time. And we were all firing. Eventually we ceased fire and took the hut, 
the roof of this hut and there this man was lying there, very badly wounded. Our medic, Sean, um, started putting a drip in him and patching him up and, and trying to save his life. And that's when I lost it completely. While putting up a drip, John got so frustrated that eventually he shot the patient right while I was working on him through the head. Then I brought the, the person that we'd captured the day before. He'd been traveling, they'd been traveling together, and I said, look, here's your companion. We know your name is Congo. We know everything about you. The game's up. You're wounded. Let's get this over with. Tell us where your gun is. Tell us where your rendezvous point is. And then it's over. And he still denied it, and I, I took out my, my pistol in a rage, and I put a bullet um, between his eyes, and I shot him. I executed him. And uh, after that, uh, it was as if I was looking at the scene from above, and I could see myself standing there with this gun in my hand, and everyone looking a bit shocked. And the, the family from the crawl standing there, and they were also very, very shocked. And the kids were just very shocked. And I walked away. I just said to the team, clean up. I said to the old man, the owner of this crawl, you must bury this body now. It's your responsibility. This is your, your problem. And I went back and I radioed into the our commanding officer who was in the radio room at the time. And I said to him, uh, I want to come in. Because actually, um, on the way to the vehicle, I decided that this is it. I'd seen myself from another point of another perspective, and I, really like an aerial view of myself, and I just couldn't believe who I was at the time. And I was, I'd had enough. I wanted to come in. I've met up with John earlier this year to try and understand why he did that and how that affected him. I went to visit him in Johannesburg. He still wears camouflage uniforms. The room where he was living was covered with camouflage netting. He's dropped out of society. He's on drugs. He's an alcoholic. And he tells me that it was all because of that day and what he did, and that he completely lost it. And that 15 years later, he's still carrying th that incident with him. Um, my life since then has been very, very difficult. It's had a big element of self-destruction. I've been through two marriages. I have a daughter. But really, I've just uh, destroyed the people around me, my friends, my family. And I think it's enough now. The war is long over and forgotten. But for many of these men, the struggle to adjust and live normal lives is far from over, especially because few now appreciate the contribution these people believe they made. Many still suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, a condition the Americans knew as Vietnam syndrome, but South African troops called bossies. I was hypervigilant. I was having screaming nightmares every night for at least six months. I was very anti-establishment, anti-social, I was cold. Whenever I heard a loud noise, I would dive to the ground. When I heard helicopters, I would look for somewhere to hide. Selfs ek het nie geweet wat gebeur nie. Wanneer ik weer bij mijn zinnen kom, was ik klaar kwaad, woedend. Niet kwaad, niet kwaad is niet die woord. Nie. Ik was een monster. Um, maar ik kon het niet verklaren. Nie. Ik kon het niet verduidelijken. Nie. Allemaal om mij het een vries geleef. Ver, zoals je ziet, zelfs het tierlepel wat val. I've got four of the symptoms like hypervigilance, which is paranoia with paranoia. It's extreme paranoia. The stress came na die tijd. Dit het vir my na die tijd gekom. Ek het nooit in my leven gedink ek lei aan stress nie. Ek het gedink my persoonlikheid is maar net agressief. Maar dit het net slechter en slechter en slechter gegaan. So dat ek vandag kan sê ek het nie een vriend nie. 
want my agressiviteit het allemaal weggejaag. Van my vriende tot my vrou. Vandag is dit net my pa en ma wat by my staan. Maar dit is genoeg om weer mee te begin. Er was one, one guy who was... He was just so bossy. It was actually amusing. I mean, he... The helicopter, whenever you heard helicopters, I mean, this is Frederick Ruchte, it's like a military town, the helicopter's going all the time. This guy heard a helicopter, he would shoot under his bed, and he would like go into, this guy was, his nerves were shot, you know, was, and they sent him back to the border. While I was there, they sent him back to the border. We had come to the end of our tether, we had been uh, involved in, in that kind of thing, seeing patients, seeing people being killed for <coughs> 12 months already and all because I wanted to go and heal people and not kill them. And we went to go and see the, the local psychiatrist um, who was resident in Oshikati and the, uh, and the major in charge of South African medical services up there. And we're basically told to grow up and carry on and that there was nothing wrong with us. And at night, you would lie in bed, you'd listen to these bizarre screams and shouts and behavior and people going quite mad in the ward next door. Um, and it was kind of over by Klompus Borsis. And it was sort of left at that, you know. And I don't think the military at the time had any idea of what they were really dealing with. Mooi, mooi, in voertuig direct geslaan. Het deel van die posttraumatische stress is dat baie van ons voel dat ons niet erkend wordt voor wat ons gedoen het nie. En dis waar ons hulp nodig gehad het. En dat weer die posttraumatische stress het nie met mense gebreek nie. Hy het families gebreek. Hy het huisgesinne gebreek. Hy het dood veroorzaak. Hy het baie skade gedoen. Post-traumatische stress is een verlangen terug naar die oorlog. Het is verlangen naar een situatie waar je weer beheer kan uitoefenen, waar je weer beschermd is, waar je niet hoeft te verduidelijken. Nie. Je moet onthou, daar is niet een man, een pa, een broer, een zuster, een boyfriend en een girlfriend om wie je optreden hoeft te verduidelijken.